Intercession is, is the word. He is thinking of that even in the middle of the night. He figures things out as he's lying in bed, working it all out in his head. And then he comes out and puts it together in the barn. He goes down here in the morning and he doesn't come in until way after time to eat dinner. Lots of times our meals are nuked pretty well by the time he gets back in. This is actually the site of all the madness that goes on in this property. It is very nice though that we do have a barn because we had pre-barn days where we had two small boys in a very small house and snowmobile restoration went on in our dining room and in our kitchen. We had snowmobiles in our house. One Christmas we had hors d'oeuvres on the seat of one of the finished snowmobiles. So it's been a long time coming to have a nice facility like this and I'm actually thankful that it, it is all contained in there. Well Daniel, believe it or not, you're in Sydney, Ohio, uh, down in central west uh, Ohio and uh, you're in uh, the barn with uh, my snowmobile collection and this is where I work on them and, and uh, keep them when I'm not at a show or, or if they're not in a museum somewhere. Uh, kind of my hobby, there's, there's 80 different brands of snowmobiles here. Uh, been collecting them since about 1972, dragging them home, putting them away and now that I'm retired uh, I've got the opportunity to uh, work on them which I love doing and then uh, riding them that's fun too and showing them to people and uh, sharing them with others uh, is all part of the satisfaction I get out of this hobby. Well this this first uh, machine you see here is a, a 1962 uh, Polaris Autobahn and you can see it's a, a little bit apart here the tracks laying on the ground I've got a track here that broke and uh, so I'm working on uh, rebuilding the track and uh, putting new wood runners under it and we'll get it ready to go again. So that's, that's one of my, my favorite machines is this uh, Autobahn. This is the uh, snowmobile that started uh, this whole crazy thing of, of collecting and fixing snowmobiles. Back in 1972, my uh, neighbor had this uh, in Waterford, Michigan, had this 1962 Polaris K70 in his garage and he was gonna junk it. So I had the opportunity to buy it and fix it up, and that's kind of where I got interested in uh, uh, the older snowmobiles and the history of them and uh, a chance to fix them up. had a lot of fun doing that, and one thing led to the next, and two led to three, and then from there, there we went. So that's the first snowmobile that I bought and fixed up. A couple others right here, uh, a 1972 uh, Thunderjet uh, that I was fortunate up enough to pick up a few years ago. Just a fun machine if you want to make your, your blood pump uh, and race, uh, this will do it for you. It's a great machine. There was quite a history with the, the Thunder Jets. I picked this up, up in Michigan and uh, it's fun to get out a couple of times a year. And right in front of you is, uh, this is uh, the rear end of a 1963 uh, Polaris uh, K70D. And as you can see, I've got the new wood runners on it and the track, and uh, I'm just working on uh, putting the, uh, the motor and transmission on, getting everything aligned up, and uh, before long, I'll be able to put the cab on it. That's a project I hope to finish uh, yet this summer. As we go on down through the line, uh, right here beside us is a kind of a unique machine. It's a 1971 Mercury uh, Model 200. And they actually called this the ugliest uh, hood they ever made. They actually changed this hood in the middle of the year. And this Mercury has a, uh, a hearth motor in it. I believe that was the only time that Mercury ever put anything but one of their own motors in a snowmobile. The snowmobile right here in front of us is a 1971 Alaska ski that uh, I was fortunate to pick up last year and uh, have restored. Uh, the unique thing about it, it uses an Italian Gadetti motor, and I believe the, uh, the Alaska ski and the Maliba skis, which were made up in Canada, are the only ones that use that Gadetti motor. I, I've heard some information that they also use that motor in a snow gear, but I haven't been able to substantiate that yet. But been real happy with this uh, machine. It turned out to be a real nice restoration. The, uh, the speedometer is Italian.
And that's the Italian Gadetti motor. The chain case is, uh, is Italian. The electrics, the headlight are all made, were all made in Italy. Uh, this next snowmobile uh, is one I just finished up and the first show I took it to was the Waconia show this winter and it was my Rupp. It's a 1967 uh, Snow Sport 300 uh, with a little Hearth uh, 300 motor in it and it's a pretty little machine and I really do like it. It's, it's turned out really nice. It's a fun little machine to ride on. And beside it is what you would call a Simcoe power sled. And these were made in Ecorse, Michigan back in the early uh, mid 60s to early 70s and you could either buy the whole thing and all together or you could buy a kit and put your own motor on it or you could buy the blueprints and actually make your own and they made single seaters and twin seaters and they basically were for use of going out and going to ice fishing on the ice. I really don't think it'd move in the snow. And what you do is you start this snowmobile up and then after you have it running, you lower that wheel down into the ice and then it will go, it will propel and it has the little tillers on the back that actually guide it. And it doesn't have any brakes, so I think you gotta be careful how fast you go and where you're headed because I think you'd have to throw out an anchor to get stopped. This is a 1973 Starfire 440, free air. And I've got both the, the cleated track and the enduro track for it. It has the enduro tank on it. And I've had that quite a while. Probably had it 10 or 15 years. And I, about three or four years ago, I finally got an opportunity to, to uh, restore it. It runs real nice. It's a nice machine. And the snowmobile in front of it here is the uh, a Polar. And the story goes there was somewhere between 21 and 100 Polars made in 1962 by Edgar Atine before he changed the name of the company or the snowmobile to Articat. This happens to be a, a Model 200 and it is Serial 3. So the best of my knowledge, it would be the third Polar built. One thing you'll notice with this uh, 1962 Polar is the similarities with a 1963 uh, Articat which is here, this is a Model 200 that uh, I was fortunate enough to find at an auction last year and I haven't had a chance to do anything with it yet, but I do have the plow for it. But you can see how the basic body shape, the skis, the wheel kit were, were all almost identical to what was on the original Polars. This is a uh, 1971 uh, Big Boss and they were made in Ovid, Michigan. Uh, in 1970 for the 71 model. Uh, the story behind this machine is there were about 20 of them made, but only eight were ever sold. And then the, the company was forced into bankruptcy and they bulldozed everything else in a, in a pit. So the, we know of three of them around the country. There's one in the Snowmobile Barn Museum of Dan Clem in New Jersey. Uh, there's one in the top of the lake Snowmobile Museum in uh, Navanway, Michigan. And this is the third one that we're aware of. Uh, just a, it got a little CCW 340 motor in them and it runs real nice. The rest of the story on these is uh, the uh, mother of the, the, of the young guy that had the company, uh, her husband's name was a girl's name and we think this might be the machine because it's called, when I found it, it had the name Marilyn on it. So it very well could be the, the owner's original machine. The Blue Snowmobile you're looking at there is a jack track. Uh, found that in New York and uh, got it back here. And all I've basically done to it is, is try to clean it up. And I did have to put a new windshield on it. The first time I drove it on the trail, uh, the old windshield just disintegrated. It's either a 73 or a 74. That's the best I... I can figure out, it uh, was, I believe they were made in Marshfield, Wisconsin. This is a uh, snow job uh, made by the same company that made snow prints. Uh, the Lionel, Lionel Corporation in Canada, they made I believe three or four different snowmobiles over the years. Uh, this is the only one I've ever seen. Uh, you can see a lot of the similarities, same type of gas tank, same style of seat as you would find on a snow prints. 
You would think this was a Polaris being red, white, and blue, but this re was restored by my 12-year-old uh, granddaughter, Carly. It's a snowflake. And about uh, two years ago, she wanted to restore her own snowmobile, so she did all of the mechanical work on this snowmobile, taking it apart, putting it back together. Grandfather painted it for A1 upholstery, did the seats for her. And she, she even made the seat bottom and learned how to use a hole saw. And, and uh, she did all of this. It took about a year and a half. And it's her snowmobile. And this December, we actually had enough snow that she could get it out and, and ride it. It's got the Cooper L Chrysler motor in it, which I believe is eight or nine horse. This is a, uh, believe it or not, a 1971 snow pony. And this snowmobile was restored over about the last year and a half by my grandson, who is 10, Jack. But he wanted his theme to be the Detroit Tigers. So you'll notice this snowmobile is a Polaris Midnight Blue and Motoski Orange, which are the very, very close to being the same colors of the Detroit Tigers baseball team. So he's really excited about this. Uh, he was really excited when he found out that his solo motor had twice as much horsepower as his sister's snowflake. So when they got out this winter to race, uh, it was hands down as to who the winner was going to be. So he was quite excited about that. Again, uh, Grandpa did the painting for him and, and he did all the mechanical work on this snowmobile. A1 did our seats. This is a, a 1963 Bonham Spartan model snowmobile. Uh, made by uh, the Tote Goat Company in Provo, Utah back in 1963. This company was probably ahead of their time with uh, the Tote Goat. They made little uh, two-wheel pneumatic scooters and uh, little four-wheel four-wheelers that were probably 25, 30 years ahead of their time uh, because now everybody's got a four-wheeler, it seems like. It's uh, got a Tecumseh motor. It's got two speeds forward one speed reverse. Uh, unique part of it is underneath it for the, uh, for the suspension, it rides on pneumatic uh, wheels instead of uh, bogey wheels uh, set up. So it's kind of wobbly until you get into a little deeper snow and then, it, and then it rides pretty good. But they only made this one year that as far as my research shows, which is about 1963. So I've got an old Fox track to use as parts to restore that. As you can see, I've got plenty waiting for me. This is one of my favorite machines to ride. This is a 1966 uh, Articat Model 460D. Uh, you can see the size of it, it weighs about 700 pounds. Uh, but uh, my wife and I can ride on this one together and we do that a lot. We like to ride this one on the trails and uh, just happened to have won the hill climb at the antique uh, event in Eagle River the last two times we've had had our meets in Eagle River. So it'll go, it'll climb right up the telephone pole. It's heavy enough and with a cleated track, but it is fun for the two of us to get in and just ride. Top speed, we've been radared before at 17. We're getting into the dark recesses of the barn here where you run into parts. And uh, I'm probably like any other vintage snowmobiler, uh, I, I drag home weird parts and parts I don't think I'll find or be able, be, be able to find when I need them someday. And sitting right there in front of me, for example, that's a, a 72 uh, Kohler 650 triple uh, that's still capped off. It's got the electrics on it. But I, don't, I don't have the carburetors, the exhaust yet, but the whole motor's there. On the shelf above it, believe it or not, are a couple of old speedways, and one of these days uh, I'll put that motor in one of those speedways. So that's where it came from. Under here, Dan, uh, underneath the shelf here, you'll see that's a 19, fairly rare 1963 uh, Articat 100. It's all there, believe it or not. It's just, I need to pull it out and uh, find the time to work on it one of these days. These are all parts manuals, motor manuals uh, for just about any snowmobile made. And then uh, I've got uh, 16 drawers of literature, all the way from A to Z. And uh, 
just about every snowmobile ever made. And then uh, back in the back here, I've got a, a set of books that took me about a year and a half to put together. But I've basically got a picture of every snowmobile that's been made in, in the books. There's a Stanaback that's in the museum at uh, Nobbinway. Uh, either looking for information of uh, what years their snowmobile, uh, what model is it, how many were made. I've got a lot of that information. Part of the satisfaction comes in me working on these and just knowing that I, I redid them, but also uh, I get a lot of satisfaction out of taking them to uh, shows and events and sharing them with other people. And uh, every chance I get, I let other people ride them. It, uh, I don't have any trailer queens here. Everything here you see uh, goes out and goes on the trail. Um, so I just, it's just a lot of fun sharing the history and, uh, and, uh, and helping preserve it. Welcome to Waconia 2011. It's our 21st year here. And uh, this year, the uh, event features the brand Rupp. There's a lot of Rupp snowmobiles here. And we're, we're having fun. Some of them are racers, some of them are consumer sleds. And uh, we're expecting a big turnout here. The weather is decent here on a January afternoon. And we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people, look at behind me here, they're ready to go on this trail ride. And uh, so we'll be able to see the trail ride. It's a big feature of the show. 11 o'clock on Saturday, over 600 sleds come through the gate. Later today, we've got drag racing, ice drag racing. Um, and, uh, and even the Antique Club is here. The Antique Club is having their winter show this year in conjunction with Waconia. And uh, you'll, so we'll see some old, uh, old snow machines going around. They have their own races. They're kind of fun to watch. Tomorrow, we have oval races. A new feature for Waconia this year is oval racing, as well as our judge show, where over 500 sleds uh, line up uh, for, for trophies and plaques. So we're ready for a big weekend here. You can hear them. You can hear them in the background. Well, here comes our trail ride, 2011, Waconia. We have uh, a leader, that's Jack Speckle. All right, first the dignitary. Here's our up. Here's a nice canoe with a cutter. All he needs is a passenger. What in the world is that? The lawn chief, all right. Here they come. Boy, everybody's friendly here today. We got a nice day for this ride. Good, good driving conditions, good ice conditions, so we're going on the lake this year. Oh my gosh, look at the cutter here. Hi, having fun on our upper. All kinds of brands. Look at this Gilson. You don't see many of them. Nice one. And now here comes some rups. They're here because that's the featured sled at Waconia this year. Right behind them, some beautiful old skidoos. They started the revolution back in the day. This one here is a tin cab. Nice job. Here's a double wide. Wave. <laughs> that thing sounds nice. And a herders. Here's some noisy racers coming through about now. So as you can see, there's every type, brand, variety. If they're old, they're here at Waconia. Double Eagle, look at these Raiders, and a Roamer. All right. Oh, and some John Deere's, they come out in force. And here's a beautiful old Yamaha, boy, that's shiny. The blue one, that's a Scorpion Whip. And look at the Mercury. Those ones were so top heavy, the argument was that they'd fall over or sitting in the garage. And some Polarises with the motor sticking out. That was the hot ticket when I was a kid. A Scorpion TK, that's a nice one. All right, here we go, more skidoos. Notice how they kind of group together in there by brand. Looking good. Moto ski there. You can see.
see the kids are riding the smaller ones. These are the starter machines. A lot of the people like to collect them. That's the first machine that they rode when they were, when they were that age. Here's a double wide Super Voyager, 30 inches, nice. And there's some skadoos. Boy, a sea of yellow coming now. Having fun. <laughs> Look at the old cards. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. They're coming in mass right now. All right. Ah. Oop. Oop. Four canoes in a row. They look like they're in a demo derby over here. What's that all about? <laughs> Beautiful skidoo RV. Nice. And here comes a skidoo. This is the Alpine. And I would again, it was a double wide track, basically used for grooming and for snow uh, on, the, on the ski hills. This, this skidoo has a sidecar. My God, I've never seen anything like that before. Nice job. Yep. Snow Prince. Now that's the. Uh, Gold color with the blue on the bottom. Very unusual. Made in Quebec, Canada. And of course, Massey Ferguson. Oh, well, look at that. All three of them. Made by the farm implement manufacturer. Suzuki slit with their blue, red, and white color combination. Unrestored, but in beautiful condition. Running fine today. Snow Traveler. And just to add to the excitement, here comes an Arctic Cat, double wide. Look at that, two side by side. And a smaller Arctic Cat right behind. Look at that, nice stuff. Triple cylinder Polaris with three cylinders sticking right out of the hood. That gets everybody's blood curling. Here comes the snow jet. Beautiful restoration here, blue in color. Uh, helmet and all. Look at that. Nice display. Beautiful. The Elan was a smaller skidoo, and they're very popular. Very collectible these days. Here's a double wide. Elite, a skidoo. And here comes a beautiful Polaris. Fully restored. Look at the character on that one. Nice job. some more antiques. One an Arctic cat up in front, a double wide, and a Polaris behind, another Arctic cat, and another Arctic cat. Yes, the antique club is here, and they're gonna have their own driving events, and we're uh, happy to see the pioneers of this sport attend and go around the lake. Look at that, beautiful. Thanks for coming, guys. Apparently the colors of the day were red and white. Well, the trail riders have just finished coming by and uh, this person here is on our Waconia committee. This is Brett Miller and he's gonna tell us what the official count is. We counted just around 700 vintage sleds and then the newer late model sleds, there's about 100. So we're a total of 800, over 800 sleds on the trail ride today. So it was a great day and hopefully we don't have any breakdowns. I think that's a record for us here. And uh, as I said, now we have other sleds that go around, or machines, and they pick up some dead ones. Back 10 years ago when I went on this ride, it would be, you know, 20% of the machines, it seemed, would be breaking down. I did that my own. But over the years, the quality of the, of, the, of the restorations, the quality of the machines, the reliability, durability factor has improved remarkably. And now, you know, you can count on one hand how many machines we're having to tow back. So that speaks to the enthusiasm of the, uh, of the people who are riding them, the availability of parts, and just how this sport is progressing over time. Well, at Waconia this year, on Saturday, we have drag racing. 
And here you can see vintage snowmobiles, but not like your grandpa drove. These are full out race machines. We are drag racing side by side on ice. And that means these machines are all picked up. You'll notice underneath every track, there's, uh, there's spikes that they screw into the track for maximum traction. These things come up and straight ahead, 600 feet, and they shut down. So it's a short period of, of distance, or it's a short distance, but uh, a short period of time. These guys are, are, uh, are using modern technology, and these machines really rip. It's very appropriate that you're here because this is the year of Rupp here, yep. and uh, you got a beautiful sled. What year is this one? This is 1976. All right, yep. and uh, and where are you from? Uh, Jackson, Minnesota. All right, yep. good, good, good. Yep. And uh, and uh, do you campaign this? How many races do you do a year? Uh, we do three three races a year. All right. Yep. All right. Yep. Well, I'm so happy that you're here. Are you going to put this in the judge show tomorrow? Yes, we are. Yep. All right. Yep. right, so you get double duty this that's, weekend. That's right. We're going to have fun up here. This is a beautiful example of a full-out race machine. Notice the three cylinders here. They have extra large carburetors to bring in fuel. These pipes are custom made. What you do is you put this on a dynamometer and then you adjust your lengths, etc. and look at all the individual wells to get that proper back pressure and the maximum horsepower. Now, in addition, they're running uh, electronic ignition. The regular ignitions on these machines don't work at these, at these high RPMs. So you have a battery operated electronic ignition. This is the way to get the most horsepower out of one of these machines. Now let me show you something else relating to this race genre here. Notice this device. What in the world are we dealing with here? This happens to be a, a cart to cool off the machines. If you have a liquid cooled machine between the races, they literally hook up these pipes to the, to the engine start that electric pump and through battery power they circulate cool fluid through the machine so that the engine cools off and gets ready for that next round so this is this is all the equipment it takes to be a top-notch uh, racing operation you've got a beautiful rup that is a racer now this is an 800 right here it says caution high performance exhaust may be harmful to hearing ear protection recommended look at that and a speedo that goes all the way up to 120 clicks now, what you're looking at right here is a hearth honker. This was a triple cylinder hearth engine that was put into many sleds, but it was a high performance engine. Notice how wide this engine is and the fact that there's not even enough room for a recoil. You wind the rope up and pull on that string. Let's take the hood off and see what this looks like underneath. Hood pins, how's that for uh, genre? Yes, and here you can see it. Now notice the three pipes, these are tuned pipes, and only so much room to fit it all in here. Um, uh, not even a chain case around here. This is a racing, you know, specific machine, and uh, it was set up, now this is a driver. You see a lot of very pretty ones here on display. The reason we're here to, right now is that this is, this is a working model uh, that's not just for show. So you can see the heavy duty construction here and uh, this thing was made for uh, one purpose and that was to go fast and win races. Rupp was a performance based company, uh, Mickey wanted that, that reputation and this absolutely epitomizes that genre. Well Rodney, uh, this is a beautiful Scorpion, I believe it's a 69, tell a us six, about yes, it. Yes, it's a 69, uh, my brother and I uh, decided we want to make a replica of what my grandpa Thurston Murnall had up in Crosby, he lived on the south side of Serpent Lake. Uh, it's got uh, a little bit different. We went and put the Scorpion big stickers on the front instead of having a stripe just to kind of do something a little different. You had the yellow windshield, electric start. It's got the thing on the back, kickstand yep. on the back, so you yep. can get it up, rev it up. The seat folds up. He used to put his uh, fishing poles in okay. there. Okay, so and, uh, basically Grandpa things. lived in the community where they built right on, these ones. Right on the lake. So and of course he had to have a Scorpion. Yeah, he did. And you remember this as a, as a yep. kid. Yep, so my brother and I, Mark, had decided we wanted to have uh, a replica of what uh, my grandpa had. Well, quite an honor for uh, for yeah. uh, for your grandpa for yep. you to, to go to this effort. Yep. And I see it fits one, <laughs> two, three, four, five kids on the back of it. Yes, it does. Yeah, say yeah, guys. <laughs> yeah, yes, <Yeah>, Scorpion. <laughs> no, beautiful job. Yep. Uh, I never did figure out that uh, Scorpion in a winter vehicle, but yeah. it worked. Oh yeah. And yeah. that black and red was very distinctive, and yep. uh, you've Trapping. done a fine. Fine, fine job of restoration yep. here. Well, thank you. Here we 
are with the Antique Snowmobile Club of America. They have a uh, winter meet every year, and this year we're honored to see them at Waconia. And uh, the club is, uh, is very active, 2,400 members strong, quite frankly. Now, a, an antique snowmobile is a, is a snow machine that is built before 1968. So it's the old, oldest of the old. And, uh, but yet these things run, certainly. What we're looking at right now is uh, a racing event. They have a drag race, oval, uh, reverse oval. Some of these machines have reverse gear. And uh, so they love to drive them and love to show them off, and that's what we're looking at right here. Behind me is some old, uh, old ones. Uh, some are restored, some are not. Doesn't matter to us, certainly. And uh, just want to give them some fresh air and, uh, and show, show everybody that uh, this is the, you know, the origins of this sport of ours. Now, many of these machines are huge. Quite frankly, they were built as utility vehicles. Um, let's get an example. Fishermen would use them. Uh, linesmen, if you were you know, uh, ma maintaining a power line, um, that sort of thing. Uh, many of them were used to uh, groom trails, so there weren't a lot of these made, but they're lovingly restored here, and uh, many of them have four cycle engines. Now, the modern snowmobile, of course, has a two cycle engine, most of them, but these ones have names like Kohler, Wisconsin, and Clinton. So these are, these are snow machines that have four cycle engines. Uh, they were a bit too hard to start, but once you got them going, they ran and ran and ran. So this isn't a speed, uh, speed vehicle at all, but they're still reliable. Parts are available. You'll see them uh, restored and, uh, and in the snow right here at Waconia. Well, you tell us what you're riding here today. Well, I've got a 1966 Articat 460D. There were 31 of these made, Valdi. Wow. And uh, this is quite a big machine. I see it's got two gas tanks, so this was made for utility work. That's correct. It was utility work. It weighs 710 pounds. I think it was rated to pull a half a ton. Really? So I've seen these uh, in the movies actually hauling logs out of the bush. That's correct. It, it won't go very fast, but it'll pull anything you got. Yeah. Well, I love your steering wheel here. Room for your uh, co-worker or your uh, girlfriend. That's correct. Yeah, a beautiful restoration here. Thank you. Uh, John, I'm interested, what brings you to an event and go to the trouble of restoring and bringing this here today? Well, it's just the camaraderie of being with a bunch of guys that like to uh, preserve the history of uh, snowmobiles from the beginning. And that's why we're part of the Antique Club, to, to not only preserve history, but to show them to people and, and get out and demonstrate what they would do for people. You got a lot of younger generation that have never seen these old machines. Yeah, I'll second that. Around us today is a bunch of people who, who probably have never seen something like this, and they're learning from, from, from history here. That's right. And they, they find we have just as much fun with these old ones as, as they do with the new ones. Now, what you've got here is a, is a Polar. Now, is this an Articat or is it before Articat? This is the first year before Articat. This is a sixth machine built by Edgar Hattin. Ho -ho! And what year is it? It's a 62. It was built in the fall of 61. It's a sixth machine built. So this is the sixth machine built by Edgar Correct. after he left Polaris. All right. Now uh, talk about the motor and the drivetrain. The drivetrain is just a usual uh, steel plate uh, 2068 chain. It's got a uh, foreign reverse gearbox on it. So if you needed to go to reverse, you would pull the lever. Right there, you're right. in reverse. And I see this machine has uh, 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 a generator slash starter. Correct. Quite a few of them under the 500E, well then you had electric. Oh, okay. then, or they had a 500D, then you had a manual start, some of them. And wow. So this is a very historic machine, a very low production number. I'm glad it's running and uh, that you brought it here today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is kind of a special item that uh, Polar had put on their machines. This was generically the first ATV. But what they did is they, when you had like deer hunting where you didn't have any snow or lower elevations, then you had the ski wheels. You pull the pans out, it takes you a couple minutes. The tires pop right down through the skis. So you can run on, on dirt or rocks. When you get up in the higher elevations, you put the pans back in and then you can slide along on the snow up into the mountains or wherever you wanted to run it or on uh, snowier seasons. Now, the goal when you're a, 
snowmobile collector is get something that's a little bit different. And uh, this is my latest project here. It is a Polaris Little Andy, Little Andy. Little Andy, Andy Wells was the name of the gentleman who when he was a kid designed this. However, this one's a bit different. This is a Canadian model. This is called Autoboggin. This was imported into Canada, not with the Polaris name. This is called Autoboggin. Moreover, the serial number on this one it says, starts with EX. It is an experimental. So quite frankly, this thing is a bit crude, but it, it's a piece of history. This is a development model that essentially got sold up in Canada. Uh, it's not the same, it's not as refined as the other little Andes I've seen, but it's so nice to go to a show and say, I got a little Andy, but it's different than yours. It's missing some parts. Like I said, kind of crude in its construction. But, uh, but if you want uniqueness and a, and a conversation piece, this, this type of thing is what you're looking for in our hobby. Okay, what we're looking at here is a 1966 Arctic Cat Model 100. Now notice the hood is, is steel. This was the last year that Arctic Cat had what we call a tin cab. And uh, it's a small model. Model uh, 100 has an eight horsepower Kohler four cycle engine. Now tell us a bit about it. I got it up in Knobbin Way, Michigan uh, a year ago. And uh, Bob Succi had it, and I bought it from him. And it was in pretty tough shape. I had, uh, it was rusted out real bad. The skis were rusted out, I had to rebuild them. And also build the, put new side panels in. A fellow in uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin had them. So basically you did a lot of metal work to get this thing in this shape. Yeah, definitely, a lot of metal work. The front had been smashed in too, but I re-straightened that out. And then the seat was gone completely, and the metal under the seat was gone. So, and a track, I had a, 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 a track from Tony Rolfus. Okay. Now give me a sense of how many hours it would take to, to do a project of this nature. I'd say at least 200 hours. By the time you take everything apart, all the pop rivets out, uh, <laughs> completely apart, put it all back together. That isn't complicated. I had a fellow paid for it. All right. Well, this is the proverbial month of Sundays. But, I, but I, I, I can see your, the love that you put into it. This has been a fun project, and I'm sure you enjoyed every one of those. Uh, yeah, I try to pick up a project every year if I can to keep me retired. Keep you healthy and happy. All right. Here's something that's very interesting. This is a reverse race. Reverse. Better be good with a steering wheel on a deal like this. These old machines had this reverse gear, and there they go. Keep looking behind you. <laughs> I think they go just as fast backwards as they go forward. <laughs> go, guys. That's a 1969 Mercury 220 ER. The 220 stands for 22 horse. E stands for electric start and R stands for reverse. And how the reverse works in the machine is when you want to back up, you shut it off. There's a switch there. You just flip it in reverse and you restart the machine and the engine rolls or runs backwards and that's how you back up. And if it, you need a little more power, you can see there's that extra knob right here, and that you can actually adjust your timing to get better backing up power. Okay, so you would, okay, for backing up, interesting, interesting. Well, I must say, Mercury built a, a different machine. They brought outboard technology to the industry. Uh, maybe not the biggest seller, but, but very unique and, and a special place in, in this vintage world. Yeah, and what's really nice too with the exhaust going underneath the seat, your seat actually warms up. So it's it's kind of like, uh, what do you say, the uh, be like the trail sled of its day or the two of its day. Mm -hmm. You know, touring sled, I guess you would call it. All right, very distinctive. And I think that brings, you know, a, a bit of character here to our event to have these different machines. And uh, this thing is, is, a, is a nice restoration and uh, you've done a wonderful job. Well, thank you very much. It's Sunday in Waconia. A new event this year, Oval Racing, the Oval Racer Alliance. Now what we're seeing here is, is uh, straight on the ice, Oval Racing at speed. These guys fly, they don't slow down at the corners, they're power through the corners. And uh, we're happy to have them here. 
It's a new event. Uh, these machines use modern-day traction products and high-performance engines, and they and they really scoot around. So we're pleased to have them here. It's a new venue. It's gaining a lot of, uh, of uh, publicity and attraction. There's a lot of people looking at this oval racing on the ice. This isn't a bank uh, curved track, but rather just straight ice. So these guys hang it out on the corner. I'm the race director for Oval Racers Alliance and the director of competition. And we put on ice oval races all around uh, the upper Midwest, both white model and vintage. And this is a vintage only show for us. This is a, one of the greatest events in, in vintage snowmobiling. And I'm really proud that ORA can get involved and get some exposure here. And I hope we uh, can build a long-term relationship with the folks of Laconia. We're running uh, 30 classes here, but we are running the Vintage Snow Pro Series, which is some of the fastest vintage iron. It is the fastest vintage iron you're going to see on the ice oval. Uh, we've got the world champion uh, Jake Gady here. Uh, Bill Stahl's rubs are very fast. Freddie Smith, uh, a lot of really fast sleds, as fast as you're going to see on an ice oval. Fast action here. And here's one of the stars. Uh, it's uh, Bill Stahl from Wisconsin. Bill, uh, tell me about uh, oval racing and why you're here at Waconia. Uh, oval racing uh, vintage started uh, about 10 years to grow in leaps and bounds. And then today we have uh, Pro Vintage Racing, Aura. Aura is here day-to-day -day racing along with a series that I run, which is the Vintage Snow Pro Series. And what that is, that pretty much highlights uh, the drivers who really are uh, constant in racing every weekend, want to run for points, want to run for money. It's a series that we have, and Aura invited us to come up here and race with them. So I think we got a really great show today. These old machines have that race, you know, genre, and boy, you guys can really pull the horsepower out of these motors. Yeah, I think it's all changed when everybody had heard that I was going vintage racing. I think everybody thought single cylinders, 30 miles an hour bumping <laughs> on the track, but this ain't nothing like this. We are going 80, 90 miles an hour out here, guaranteed for sure, on old vintage race sleds, and it's just a feeling that's phenomenal. Bill has been involved in RUP for many years, and quite frankly, he's got some of the machines that are highlighted in that ballroom. Now tell us about some of those. Uh, the sled I have in the ballroom is a 73 Magnum. It's Gene Bloom's original 73 Magnum that he raced. It, I found it, a uh, guy approached me, I bought it. Uh, we restored it. It was all together, all intact. And uh, we didn't have to add any parts to it. It was just a piece of history that was frozen in time. Also, next to that is a 74 Rupp Third Dimension. It's a magnesium tunnel and bulkhead. It's uh, last year that Rupp really was involved highly in uh, racing effort. Uh, it was a slow pro year. They built some very exotic equipment. The, like I said, the mag magnesium tunnel and bulkhead. Um, they had a 340, 440, and 650. Exotic parts through the whole machine, super lightweight. Uh, factories are doing whatever they could to gain an edge, and that was one thing to try to make them as light as possible. Well, here at Waconia today, we have some race legends. These are uh, Binkley Brothers. Uh, Fairbanks, Alaska? That's it. And these guys, no up. they were part of the action back in the 70s. Now, what do you think about this racing here today, John? Oh, it's so exciting. It's just amazing. It's a thrill for us to come down from Alaska and see all the competition, see the new machines, how, how people have really restored the old vintage machines, too. So much a part of our lives, and to see the movement here where everybody has really embraced these vintage snow machines. We love it. It just must have been so fun when you were kids to, to embrace that brand and run with it. What do you think, Jim? Well, that's for sure. When, when we were kids, we didn't go home and watch uh, television. We worked on our snow machines, and we, uh, we call them snow machines. Of course, the snowmobiles here, but in Alaska, we still call them snow machines. But uh, that was a way of life for us when we were growing up, and uh, we just have so much admiration for all the folks here that restore these machines and bring the, the racers back on the track in, in such wonderful form. We're, we're, we are completely uh, blown away. It's, it's beyond our belief. We had no idea it had gone to this, uh, this far. All right, John, I was curious, what models of Rough did you run? Well, when I raced for the factory, the 73 Magnum 440 was a big machine. Here's a picture of it right there on the Waconia button. This is me at Ironwood, December of 72. I was able to win Mod 3 there. That was a thrill of a lifetime for me. We got an event called the Loud Snowmobile Contest. And as you can see, what they do is they park their machines over there, and there's a decibel meter, a noise, uh, uh, you know, measuring device. And we're going to see sleds that have tune pipes and ones that have megaphone pipes. And, uh, and basically, it's the loudest one wins on this deal. And uh, they have to have a tether. We don't want to have any runaways here. And you can see that they're in a little alcove there. 
and uh, protect it so the public doesn't uh, uh, see parts fly. So basically, it's just rev it up, rev it up, rev it up, and we're going to measure the, uh, the sound. 119.3, 119.3. Listen, what prompted you to make something like this? I see that you got a, 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 a tailpipe from a car and then a muffler. Uh, actually, I had an exhaust pro shop mended up for me, and uh, we were uh, looking out to beat out race sleds, and uh, I was told this is the best single cylinder to go with, 335, the bigger the board, the more loud uh, thump you'll get out of her, and uh, obviously with uh, megaphones, or obviously will give you the best thing, and all that so. so you're trying to make some noise with this guy oh yeah a little bit <laughs> Well, Mike, I think that you uh, just won the loud snowmobile contest. <laughs> now, these are megaphones, basically a cone that sends the exhaust uh, straight and forward. Correct. Now, tell us about this machine and uh, and uh, your nice restoration here. Well, it's it started out as a basket of parts, and uh, I've slowly been trying to build it up into a little mod sled. It, was, it wasn't good enough to restore, so I decided to go with the mod theme on it. I call it my retro mod. Yes. And... Uh, uh, we just been having a lot of fun with it. Well, yes, I, you've been having a lot of fun with it. And uh, and with these megaphones, you get a, you get attention there. Yes, you do. Now, what was your decibel reading? Do you remember? I, uh, I think they said 123. Yeah. Well, this will this likely is going to win this. Event. But nonetheless, it's a beautiful sled. Thank you. And I'm glad you're having fun here at Waconia. Oh yeah. Yep. I won today, so it's good enough. <laughs> okay, let's point to the uh, to these two megaphones there. So this is a two-cylinder opposed uh, engine with two megaphones there, and you got the uh, the prize. Yes. Rampage <laughs> from Rampage's garage. This is a part sled. And every year I, I haven't won, I, I vowed to come back louder and dumber. And this year I won. This is the year of Rupp at Waconia. And uh, you can see a sea of, uh, of red paint here and chrome skis. Now, this is the earliest generation of these Rupp machines. And uh, they, they generally had the name Snow Sport. So this is, uh, you know, middle to later 60s. And these, believe it or not, are unrestored. In beautiful condition. And uh, you can tell these things haven't been ridden uh, very much at all. Next to us there is the restored models and you can hardly tell the difference between these beautiful unrestored machines and, and uh, those over there. But we like the style of the Rupp. They, they accentuated the red with the uh, black seat and, uh, and the chrome bumper and, and skis. Uh, generally known as a, just a beautiful machine and, uh, and uh, very, uh, very artfully done. I think Mickey Rupp had a knack for uh, design and, uh, and creating a, a, an appealing looking machine. On these rough machines, uh, in that era, your track would literally get stuck to the ground. So this bar goes down and you leave the track off the ground. And it was basically an attempt to warm the machine up. You gun the motor, get the track a spinning, and then flip this thing back and take off. from the year 1970 to 1978. And here you can see the styling cues that were used 
Uh, you'll see almost every ski here is, is chrome. The seats were black and, uh, and, and, and well, uh, well, well, well featured. So these are the restored machines. Notice the hood pins. Uh, cars of the era, this was hot. This was a hot trend. Mickey Rupp was into the automotive themes. So, uh, so you see hood pins. That literally held the hood down on, on these rucks. And, uh, and uh, we were happy that so many came. I don't know who's gonna win this class because there's a tremendous amount of competition here in this, uh, in this row of rucks. My personal favorite, Ruff, was a model called Nitro. This thing reeked of speed, of class. Here you can see a whole row, these are not the same year, but look at the styling cues and the beautiful restoration work that people have done. When you showed up with one of these, you were, you were Mr. Hotshot. Uh, beautiful execution, the you know, pointed hood, pleated seats, and, uh, and uh, well, well use of, of, of colors. Um, these all had big twin cylinder engines in them. And as I said, when it comes to me and, Ni and Rupp, it's nitro. This is a beautiful restoration. What year is your nitro? 1975. It's, uh, it's the free air model. Yeah, FA stands for free air. You can see the cylinder heads and, and the air coming in. Definitely. And uh, But this is a racer. I see a little bolster here. So this was yeah. kind of for oval racing where you're hanging out. And uh, and uh, there's zero on the uh, speedometer. Did you uh, did you just restore this and, and uh, it's been unrun? Yeah, over the last three months, I've totally rest restored it. Three months? Yeah, three months. My restorations take three years. You're a fast worker. Look at this beautiful job, well, and uh, I'm very proud ready. of you. I want to get it ready for Antonio. All right, good, good, good. No, this is as good as it gets. This is probably better than brand new. I appreciate that. Everybody asked about this if they made it. They didn't. There was an Articat at one time. Uh, I had a custom suspension underneath it with a full cleated track, but I blew that out. But uh, it was just a piece of junk I had laying there, so I thought I'd make something different out of it. Uh, put it together, my grandson run it until he blew it up last year. And then I put a 16 horse, 100cc uh, Chrysler motor in it. This thing will take me a 220 pound and just rip across the snow. <laughs> So, just to say my grandson don't want to ride it no more. <laughs> so you started with a kitty cat, you modified it in all kinds of ways, both on the design side to make it erupt, yep. but also on the powertrain side. Yep. <laughs> well, we like you. You got the spirit. Yep. He moves. Yeah. Oh, it's very unusual. You gotta. Uh, you gotta say that. I've had dealers come up and ask, "Well, why didn't we get one of them?" Yeah. But they didn't make them. They don't want yeah. Them, but... No. No. I appreciate your creativity and. Uh, and, uh, and this is very unique. We had to come and say hi. Yeah. This is a racer. You can tell there's got a special uh, air cleaner. It's, it's got the tune pipe and, and it looks like it's got the same badging back in the day. Tell us about it. A uh, guy from Seymour, Wisconsin, a buddy of mine, Bill Moss, which is dead now. He raced this from 1971 to 76. That's why she's got all the modifications. Trophies up to Ying with it and she just goes and sounds loud. It's fun. Yeah, wonderful. So this is a period correct, unrestored yep. old racer. Yep, this is the way he raced it. Never been touched afterwards. All right, well, it's, I'm glad. It don't match 100 for the year, but with all the years of modifications on it, this is what it come out to be. Yep, he was my neighbor when I was a kid, and I used to hear this thing two blocks away all the time, you know, so it's like, I got to have it. <laughs> now, this one caught my eye. This is a JLO engine, but it's kind of small. Tell us about this sled. Well, this one's 14 horse. They come originally out of Minnesota up here. Just the shape you see it, original Survivor, laying on a guy's shelf up in the attic. But they're rare to come by because this motor come in the Rupster four-wheelers. This model, some Boa skis. Tri sport equipment. Everybody blew the motors up in them. They jumped the sleds out to get their motors. Now you don't find it. Yeah, so that's anymore. the rareness, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, no, this is a very unusual one, even for this event with all these rucks here. Yep. Uh, I saw it on eBay. Um, it would sit in a barn for years. Mm -hmm. But I've had an American. In fact, the one in the ballroom is mine. Okay. And that one I actually. Uh, know that sled because I helped put it together in 72. What do you mean put it together? These came in a crate 
My uncle was a dealer. You had oh, to piece okay. it together. Okay, and so you uh, did the assembly work. Well, I got to help. Yeah. I was only 12. Or wow. Three. But uh, that's been in the family since. And uh, that was my pride and joy. That was my baby. That's all original. So I've always liked the Americans. They're white mm -hmm. track, more stable. Yes. And uh, electric start. So that's nice. <laughs> well, good. It's great to see that. If you bought that on eBay, that means they can still you can still get them. 175 bucks. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, don't, I haven't done anything to it. Wow. To wash it up. All know, right. That pigeon poop and stuff on it. But. Good for you. Good for you. Well, I think this one wins the long distance award. This is a Nordwerk Husky. This is a snow machine that was imported from Sweden. A fellow found it. It was an antique. He brought it to America. This thing runs. I saw it drive up. Believe it or not, you sit in the back here with these controls and operate this traction unit. Now notice that the motor is inside the track. So believe it or not, the motor, it's an Italian motorcycle motor, and, and it rotates this track, and I don't know how it works, but believe it or not, I saw this thing come up here and park. And uh, it's got to win the unusual, long distance, and weird award for today. Uh, Tony has done a good job. He got it going. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's going to take it any further. But what a very unusual piece that you drive and operate from the back unit here. I can imagine the snow would come up and give you a splash, so that's why it's got this, this, uh, this windshield here, gas and oil. I don't know, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's here at Waconia, and we're happy to have it. It is a Polaris by architecture, but this was a model that was sold in Canada. In Canada, there was a department store called Eaton's, and everybody got the Eaton's catalog. I saw this as a child, in the back of the Eaton's catalog. It was a mail order only option. Basically what it is is a 67 Polaris that was redesigned. They made this funny looking hood uh, and a cover over the engine. Basically it was used to, to burn up some old 1966 parts. The skis on this snowmobile, the gas tank, and the engine are carryover 1966. So what they did quite literally was to send those parts up to Mosesure, Manitoba, where the Polaris plant was, and reconfigure it, make it look a little bit different, and sell it as a 1967 Eaton's snow track. So when you find these machines, they're very rare. There's just a few of them around there. And, uh, and this is a good restoration, and it shows uh, 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 you know, a, a unique take Everybody says, hey, that's a 67 Polaris, but not really. <laughs> so that's what we like about these machines, is that uh, it just shows how they were trying to market these to different audiences and in different configurations. And uh, it was at the heydays of the, the sales of these machines. These were very popular. Uh, everybody had to have one. Eaton's company wanted something a little bit different. And voila, a Polaris turns into an Eaton's snow track. We named this Fire on Ice. So we got this right here. This is my friend Jason Johnson here. Yeah. These are two rough snow builds. They're mounted together right in the center. And what it is is a 440 rough engine on the rear that powers the rear chassis. These are real fire axes that we got from the local fire department. Yes. Yep, and we, it's a Fire on Ice. So basically the drive unit is in the back. And, uh, and, and it runs and it drives. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And, uh, and why the Rub Tea? Was it just your favorite brand? Well, this, yep, the Rub Tea sponsors the you know, bills every year, and the year is the Rub. So we took a couple Rubs and we made it the year of the Rub. Okay, good. Well, uh, Next year, you're going to have to build some kind of chaparral rig. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. No, very unusual. I'll bet you this got a lot of attention here today. Yes, sir. Well, quitting time here in Waconia. Uh, year 2011, we had our best year yet in terms of attendance, in terms of the racing action, in terms of our trail ride with 800 sleds in it. So we're very proud. We had beautiful weather here. You can see people are, are kind of packing up and moving out and we'll see you next year.
Hey, welcome to Eagle River. Crisp January day. This is the uh, Eagle River famous derby track. This weekend is the vintage racing. Oh, almost a thousand entries of vintage sleds. Who would believe that this racing heritage would carry over from the old days? They've got these old machines rip and roaring across this oval track. Eagle River, of course, has had this race since 1964. What a tremendous history. Of, uh, of snowmobile racing and and uh, and everybody loves to come out and, uh, and 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 watch these things go round and round. New technology applied, but still these are the old machines, true and true. Those motors might be making a bit more horsepower now. They got some new tricks, but this is the old iron, and it's proving successful for these uh, for these racers. You can see the fans behind me. This is a fun day, the whole weekend long. In fact, it's a three-day event. Every year they get more entries to this. And uh, it's amazing, I don't know where these machines are coming from, but these old racers keep showing up and, uh, and uh, it's just a blast. Is this your first time? No, I've been here about 20 years. 20 years? Yeah. What brings you back? Um, the excitement, the close racing, the fans, fun. Yeah. Do you mind standing out here in the cold? No, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> I was here in 82 when it was 40 below, this is nothing. Yeah. So you're a, a long timer here. Yeah. What's your favorite brand, brand, if I don't mind asking? Yeah, right here. <laughs> yeah, my dad brought me here in 72, and I've pretty much been coming on and off ever since then. All right. Well, I love the old sleds, the vintage racing. It's pretty cool to see that old stuff out here running around. Well, it sure is. And where are you coming from? Uh, we actually have a place up in Land Lakes, but we're from down Milwaukee Way. All right. So this is a tradition for you and your family? I haven't missed it in 25 years. 25 years? Yep. Wow. We'll be here next weekend too. All right. My second time here. Yeah. All right. And how far did you come from? Uh, from Shawano, Wisconsin. Shawano. Okay. It's two right. and a half hours. And why the vintage? Why not wait for the late models next year or next uh, weekend? I like the old snowmobiles. What do you mean you like them? Uh, I don't know. I'd like to get into racing someday, so it's an easy way to get into it. All right. So what? If you start racing, what kind of brand? What kind of machine are you going to be looking for? Uh, Yamaha SRX 340 SRX? or 440 fan. All right. All right. Eagle River. Where are you from? Wenatchee, Washington. Washington State, do they drive snowmobiles down there? They absolutely do. <laughs> Lots of them. So, uh, so uh, why the vintage side? Why not the new stuff? Uh, because I'm 54 years old and I like the vintage stuff. Yeah, and when did you start snowmobiling yourself? Uh, 1969, I was 13 years old. First sled, been snowmobiling ever since. Really? Yeah. Okay. Came back here and raced in 2005 and had a great time and now I just come back and watch. All right, so you have race, a racing pedigree then. Hard uh, again? Merck's not Twister. I ride Hard again for us, Okay. Well, these uh, Twisters, I don't know where they're coming from, but you keep seeing new ones showing up. Yeah, they keep showing up. It's good to see them out there. It sure is. It's just fun to come back and watch all the sleds. All right, now how many uh, times have you come to this racetrack? Oh, uh, I've been coming since 1970. 1970, now how old would you have been at that time? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> were you riding a snowmobile or were you a spectator? No, no. My uncle used to take me every year, and I was here when Villeneuve won in 73. I, I'd go to Ironwood, I used to go to Rhinelander, Anago, Monaco had races in 70, 71. Um, I've just been hooked ever since. It sounds like you got the fever, bad. <laughs> yeah, now we restore some old sleds. Good, good, good. So you're still interested in this? And it's, uh, it's a great time to meet some old friends. I've met many people here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I know a lot of racers, too. I'm good. pretty good friends with a lot of them, and it's just a fun hobby and a fun sport. Uh, we have two boys that are racing. Oh, they're racing? Yeah. All right. Uh, might they be riding Yamahas? Absolutely. <laughs> so how are they doing? Uh, well, their uh, race is uh, coming up, so we'll oh, hopefully snow they'll cross. make it into the uh, final snowcross race. All right. So you're just nervous right now waiting for that... Uh, that uh, race to come up. Yes, yes we are. Now, they're going to be riding in the middle here, aren't they? The snowcross side? And have they experience in doing this? Uh, yeah, they've been racing. Their dad raced a long time ago, and uh, it's kind of in their blood, so hopefully they'll do well. What a great family tradition. <laughs> I hope you have some fun, and I hope they win. Thank you. I'm here spectating my husband racing snowmobiles. And what kind of snowmobile would he be driving? Yamaha 250. All right. Have you seen him race yet? Yes, he actually took first in his heat, so first he'll be coming. Place. Yep. All right. So you're here for uh, the heats and then the final, I hope. Yes, sure am. Okay. Now, if he wins, what are you going to do to celebrate? 
Nothing. Oh, come on. How about a steak dinner on the way home? Oh, that would be good. All right. That would yes. be good. That'll, that'll. I could, I could handle that. <laughs> now, where do you come from? All the way from Hotlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Yep. What, is it just too warm for you down there? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't miss this for the world. This is, this is what it's all about. It's vintage snowmobile. How many times have you come to this race? Three times, and uh, I expect to come back many more times. So in other words, you'll leave warm Atlanta to come down here and uh, stand on a cold uh, afternoon on the snow just to watch these races. In a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Now, what is your history with these old snowmobiles? Well, I just, uh, really takes me back. I like the moto ski and the snow jet, and I'm, I'm pretty much an Articat guy, but seeing all of them here is, is, is huge. Well, yeah, you can't do it at home. You might as well come up here where it snows. Hey, I got three Articats in my garage down in Atlanta, and people think that uh, <laughs> they're for the water. <laughs> yeah, they don't probably wouldn't know what a snowmobile is. No, nope, I haul them up here, and uh, I get quite a crowd when I crank them up in my driveway down in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Hey, thanks for coming to Wisconsin. All right, you betcha. I'll be back. Well, I, you know, I love the vintage because... Uh, I lived through this era. I raced these same sleds back when I started racing, and uh, so just like these guys, it's for me. It's living a little bit of the past, and uh, I enjoy it uh, extremely much. You know, it's just as much I enjoy uh, next weekend for the championship. It's still a, a, a sport that's evolving um, with everything, with rules, with uh, all kinds of stuff, and uh, it's getting bigger every year. Um, we just got to keep our minds together and keep it the way you know, affordable and good for everybody. Well, we've been a part of the uh, derby track for uh, quite a few years now, probably going on about uh, 10 years. And uh, we've been growing our relationship with uh, myself and uh, the Amsoil Derby track, along with Amsoil, and growing the, uh, the support that uh, they've given the derby track. Congratulations on winning the 440 Supermont Championship. Yeah, Started you, out the race just a teeny bit back. Uh, how'd you get through to everybody to the front like that? Good speed and uh, just trying to look for openings. Okay. Yeah. And um, what else can you tell us about the race that's going to stand out for the rest of your life, <laughs> as well as ours? Um, well, last year was, was kind of a heartbreaker because uh, I went nine and a half laps and, and it uh, uh, crapped out on me, but uh, I guess we got, uh, we're good for 11 this year. <laughs> So did you detune her a little bit for this year or not? No, just uh, 
Probably mix a little more oil in there, <laughs> a little more AMS oil. All right, congratulations. Todd is the master of disaster, the master of chaos, the final say when the saying gets done for anything here at the Derby track. So what's the final word? We're having a great race today. I'll tell you, it's exciting to see the numbers that we have, Larry, you know, and, and it's a well-oiled machine once you get it going, but there's a there's 250 volunteers that make this happen. I just coordinate it, it's all I do. Fantastic. The field of guys you got out here for the World Championship so far, what do you think? You got a favorite, anybody you're looking at or you're gonna pick? Oh, I never pick. All I want is to be, when it's done, it's done, and everybody's safe. That's When that box doesn't move down there, that's all I want. So here with Brandon Gentz, who just qualified and moves up into the WC already today, correct? Yep, uh, we're into the semifinals, one more set of qualifying, and uh, we should be in the main show as long as everything goes good. All right, and you just got done running the 440 race. I believe you got third there, correct? Yep, you third. Did. Tough, uh, tough race for third, but we, uh, we pulled it out against my teammate, Nate Foyt, so he did a great job too, and uh, congratulations to Bullet. Uh, they did a great job, and um, that was a great race. It really was. I wish the track was a little bit smaller, but... Oh well, we'll deal with it. New sled, right? Yes. All right, tell me a little bit about the sled. Uh, it's an 800 Starfire. Randy here built it, called me about two weeks ago. He needed a driver, and here I am. I'll let you take it away since you built it. So how did the, just calling him two weeks before you wanted to put him on that monster, how did that work out? Worked out pretty good. Uh, I've seen him drive before, and my engine builder suggested he'd be a good uh, good driver also. So. And the motor, when did you, did you start on that early in the year, late in the year? It's been a couple year project. We've been at it quite a while. Yeah, we've been, it's been a... Tell me a little bit about the heads on there, because they look pretty amazing. Uh, Randy's Neighborhood Machine Shop made those. We, we designed the combustion chamber and stuff, and then they, they did all the machine work. 14 hours ahead, I think they said, on the CNC machine. So you turn it on and go home, let it run. And the chassis was all something you built? Yes. It's all, uh, it's a replica of a 73 Starfire, all made of the... 50, 50, 52 aluminum, that's what the Polaris Race Department said they were made with back in the day, and uh, that's how we, uh, we re redid it. So, uh, Tony, tell me about the track so far. How does it look for you? You're returning as the world's champion. What do you think for your uh, outlook for the, for the uh, 2011 race? Well, we're a little bit behind the eight ball. We had a fire last year in the spring, and we lost all of our equipment, so everything we got this year is new. Uh, we got about four laps on it in practice, and that's it. So we're a little behind the eight ball, but uh, we went out there, and two of our guys won their first heats. Um, I finished fourth, so I got to go into quarterfinals, which puts me at a disadvantage. Uh, but I think uh, I made some handling adjustments, and we should be good uh, for qualifying. And then uh, hopefully we can get something done for the for the final. But uh, right now uh, we're struggling a little, but we'll be good. Uh, I got to ask you, being that you have the possibility here to be the first three-time world champion. Any kind of weird pressure from that? Does it does it bother you? Do you just not think about it? No, I I'm not. Uh, I'm not one to dwell on any of that stuff. Uh, we're we're on a mission as a whole team this year, uh, just to give Andy uh, Miller three in a row. Um, I think we've got a real good chance of doing it. Jacob is fast again this year. Man, does he does he got some smoke under the hood? Uh, we'll see what we can do. It's it's not much pressure to me. Uh, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. I've got two. Uh, my brother and my son don't have one. If they get it, that's great. So, I'm here with Jacob Gady, who won the World's Championship in 2006. Yep, yep riding, that's correct. Riding this same machine, correct? Actually, no, this is a new version. Same engine, but uh, a little bit different chassis-wise. So. Okay. And tell me a little bit about the race team. Who's all helping you? Who helps you? And uh, who comes out here and works with you all every every year? Um, well, it's uh, mainly my two brothers and my mom and dad uh, come along. Uh, it's kind of a family deal. Um, Erica, my girlfriend, has been along here the last, well, four years, I guess. So um, that's kind of the main people who, who are helping us out. Uh, we got got a family friend that's doing our motor work. And um, Larry Preston here comes along for quite a bit of it. And uh, so it's it's a fun uh, fun time. Okay, now tell me about the track so far. I know with the, the heavy leaf springer sled, it's a little tougher to get around that track fast, but you seem look like you're going quite fast out there today. Yeah, so far so good. Uh, it's pretty rough already. Um, you know, the derby track's doing the best they can. Um, so many entries here, it's just amazing. It's uh, really cool that they're getting this much participation, but um, the track's rough. Um, just try and hang on to it the best we can. Uh, so far, we got the speed. We got plenty of speed. Um, so if I can hang on for 10 laps, we should be in really good shape. All right, I'm here with uh, Matt Gady, who just placed second in the 440 Vintage Sleds World Championship, uh, beating up on a whole bunch of 440s with a little 340 machine. How'd you pull that off? A lot of people wondering, how the heck is he doing that? 
Yeah, the uh, 340 is amazing. You know, we got a local guy doing our motors, and he does an excellent job. I can't thank him enough. And, you know, our chassis work real good. We make up time in the corners, and the 440 is pulled a little bit, but we're able to make it back through the corners. So that's how we did it. It looked like a lot of your corner speed, you're just pulling up on, on Fred Smith, who did win the race, and, and uh, looked like you were passing him a couple times there and got him around him. He just had too much for you on the straightaways? Yeah, Freddie's motors are uh, amazing. I mean, he's got every class he's in, he's got more power than anyone, so uh, he does a good job with his motors. All right, we're here with Bill Elvis Stowe, representing the Rupp Factory Snow Pro Team as a one-man uh, Rupp machine, uh, qualifying for the World Championship today. Tell me a little bit about the track, where you at, how do you feel? Uh, we got a great hole shot, ran second, and then I uh, got tangled up a little bit with the Peltonellis with the IFS sled. No, no big deal, just good racing, uh, but finished third, went to the semifinal, one more round, and we'll make the final hopefully. All right, so you got one more to go. How's the sled running? Excellent. It's got a lot of power down the straights, and uh, it's a bit hard to handle around the corners this mid month, but we got it handling good, and uh, it's going to be a good race. All right. Now, the thing I want everybody to notice on this rep, Bill's motor is about four feet higher in that chassis than everybody else. Well, four feet's an exaggeration, but he's running a mid-mount motor. That makes it a little bit of a disadvantage for Bill. Bill doesn't seem to care. How did you compensate for moving that motor up and getting it higher like that? This is my 11th year of racing, and I've been a Rupp fan my whole life, and I was going to race Rupp snowmobiles, and when this racing started, it was 1973 and older, and this is what Rupp had for a race sled, so this is what I grew up or learned to race on, and I think it was just years of experience uh, you know, to, to get this thing to handle so good around the corner. And I just think I mastered it and it works out good for me. So it just kind of fit you after years of just working on it and beating on it and trying to get her to, <laughs> trying to fit. Beating on it is right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Bill. Good thank, luck to you and congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, and most of them did a really nice job, but I think they kind of knew that I was probably the leader or something, and they, they didn't fight me or anything, so um, worked out good. <laughs> and you had a good day otherwise, too. You won quite a few races today. Can you run down that list? Can you remember it all with this much pressure on you? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, we won, or I won 73 and older 340 Pro Mod, and then uh, 85 and older Snow Pro 340 IFS, and I got third in IFS X. Uh, and then my brother won 340 Super Mod Free Air and Liquid, 250 Super Mod Liquid, and then got second in the Vintage Sleds uh, dot com uh, <laughs> Super Mod 440 Championship. So. so a good weekend for 3G racing here at the Vintage World Championship. Two-time winner Jacob Gody. Congratulations, buddy. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> and we're out. the 11th annual A1 Swap and Show. Um, we're probably a little over half full on Friday. Um, it's antique, vintage, and new. Snowmobile, motorbike, minibike, ATV, and Wave Runner, or PWC, whichever way you want to go. Um, we got vendors here, we have dealers, we have support from all the major area uh, snowmobile dealers and bike dealers. Uh, people are here from as far as Alaska. Uh, they're from Maine all the way to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, the Midwest, Illinois, Minnesota, Dakotas. Last year we even had them come from California. And of course I can't forget Canada, which makes us a little international. Uh, Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and last year I think we had 13 states and three Canadian provinces present. But it's a, it's a fun show, it's a beneficial and profitable for most, whether they're buying or selling, as well as snowmobile clubs, uh, youth achievement. I can't stress more about our Youth Achievement Scholarship Program to help 13 through 19 year olds and this year we started the 8 through 12 year olds with the help of dads and grandpas and I'm really promoting it. Dana Wiltsey and myself, Dana lost a son, uh, he was 24 and I lost a grandson in 2005 and, and Dana's son Jason was not too long after that but my grandson was 20, going to be 21. And so Dana and I used to race against one another years ago in Enduro. And so we talked it over with this happening, and we thought we need to do more work with the kids, get them going in the right direction, helping them because they're going to need a lot of help down the road. And if this helps, all the more to it because that's what it's all about. That's our future. Well, I got involved when my dad bought a Skidoo Olympic back in probably 67, 68. And then he bought a Johnson and we trail road. And during that point till 70, uh, we pretty much trail road. And at that point in time, Bill and I helped start the Flushing Frozen 40 Snowmobile Club. We were the first ones to have them. They're still in existence, Flushing, Michigan. Um, from that point, I started racing for uh, a RUPS, which was um, K&M Cart Shop out of Flushing. And their son and I raced together non-sanctioned, and that started about late 70 into 71. And from then, it went on uh, non-sanctioned for about a year. And then I started racing sanctioned MISA. And then that was over the number of years, which included uh, dra summer drag racing, ovals, cross country, enduros, and I've raced snow pro. And that took me up to 83 from, from basically 71 on, 72 to 83. And my dad was taking care of one of my sleds and my husband took care of the other two. And at that point in time is when my dad got cancer and I quit racing basically because of that 
because they only had given them a short time. And I don't have brothers or sisters, so that my folks meant a lot to me. And they were always there for me, and my two girls have always been there too. So they are the future for A1, basically. Oh, the love of the sport, the people, the just the activity. Oh, hey, I'm always busy. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a multitasker. I do 20 things today? at one time, and I guess it just kind of fits right into the picture. But I love the people. Last year, the warnings brought the Boss Cat 3, and prior to that was the Boss Cat 2. Uh, Don Schmidt has bought the funny car. Uh, uh, warnings has always brought other other ones. I've had the little gals that uh, the dragsters, the junior dragsters. Uh, this year is just a different year. I don't always have the same thing, and I try to bring something for everybody to see, whether it's old or new or something land speed or whether it's a special unique machine. I know there's some that's coming. They might not be here till later today or tomorrow that are unique, like Yvonne Duhamel's, one of his sleds is coming. Um, I got some Bowskis coming out of Canada that are special. Um, I guess we just invite everything. This year I think there's supposed to be some rat sleds here. There's a contest going in one of the, the clubs. Uh, we've got Bob Bracey's corral, which we do a tribute to, that it's Raiders and Mantis. And so we're, we're featuring twin, uh, twin tracks to uh, represent Bob Bracey's tribute, and that's in the small tent. All day today, Friday, and there'll be a lot more coming in tomorrow, even more people and more swappers. So it doesn't stop. It starts Wednesday night, Thursday. Show starts Friday and Saturday, but they still keep coming. Basically, everybody loves the show, and so do I. Bill and I really appreciate everything because you people are the people that make this event. And it's not him and I. It's This is what the, sled, or the show not to be missed is the one because the people make it that way. This is a great swap meet for Michigan. Place to buy toys and more toys and more junk. Uh, take home, put on a shelf, or maybe use someday. It's great. Coal, place to buy toys, like this sprocket right here. I'm looking for more sprockets. Anybody got a sprocket? As you go across your program, you see a beautiful blonde. Her name is Diane Miller. And I remember her kicking butt against the men way, way back. I'll let her tell those stories. Some of the vintage sleds she has are priceless. And I bet she wished she'd have kept every sled she raced in her career like all of us do. To introduce our next inductee, I'd like to ask Tina to come up, Diane's daughter, to say a few words about this phenomenal lady, her mother. Since the first time that I was put on snowmobile, between four and five years old, <laughs> I, uh, snowmobiling and snowmobiling racing has always been just a normal thing of my life. It's just something we, we did. I thought it was normal. Uh, it was great. I got to miss a lot of Fridays of school because uh, we had to take off for the races and I didn't think anything of it but everybody else thought it was weird that I was leaving to go to a snowmobile race to watch my mother. I, I commend her and her courage to overcome and the respect she had to gain um, with all her fellow men and women um, but she did it and, and did it very well and I'm very proud of her and uh, she's my inspiration, so, Diane Miller. What an honor and what a privilege. I don't really deserve it. I think all of you have made this possible. As far as my career, I never considered it a career. I enjoyed racing 
and that's what I wanted to do. And one way or another, I figured, you know, if that's what I wanted to do, that's, there were certain things I had to do to do it. Even if we had to travel many miles and not be able to race, which happened many times um, over the years. I did race close to 15 years. God, I want to thank all of you. You've made this happen. You've made this here happen. And we have an annual A1 show for 12 years now. And I've always insisted on a racer reunion, a family reunion. And that's what it has become. And, and it's got more people closer together, uh, bringing in the kids, their kids, the grandkids, great grandkids. And that's one thing I want to stress is I'm not living yesterday. I'm still living today, which is almost tomorrow. And tomorrow is the future. And our kids are our future. So I just want to stress how important this is. And I'm so privileged and honored. And I just think I'm very, very blessed. And I want to thank everybody. Well, today is um, our annual antique show and ride, and this is our afternoon ride. We take usually, usually it's the older sleds that go on this ride because it's a much shorter ride. So, and then we all ride up here, and then we have a bonfire. We cook, roast some hot dogs, and everybody gets to hang out and have a little bit of fun. And we usually have some races and that kind of thing. Got to try out all the old sleds, you know. I bought this sled in uh, March of 2004, and then through the year I restored it, and uh, had it going ever since, bringing up the Nobbin way. I think this is about our fourth time up here. Of course, the last couple of years, they've been too good with the snow conditions, but and I've taken it around to other shows around the state. This is a 1976 Snowjet SST 440 fan-cooled engine. It has a Yamaha motor in it. Uh, I had, to put a, I had to go find a new tunnel for it because the guy that had it before me used to race it and then they had studs in the track and they'd jump up and down on the back and it ripped through the chassis. So I found another chassis for that and uh, basically just went through the whole sled. I had the hood repainted and basically every nut and bolt. This is uh, a lot of fun. So I think that, you know, seeing all these old sleds and talking to people and even when we're at the shows and people come up to you and they'll say, I remember when my dad had one of those and stuff like that, you know, so this was the last year for Snowjet and then Kawasaki bought them out in 77. They had a Kawasaki Snowjet and then that was it for that. I like mine. They've had good times on it. You get a lot of good compliments too. Well, uh, I was at my dentist one day and I uh, got talking to my dentist. Told me his father-in-law had an old sled that he kind of wanted to get rid of and I ended up buying it. 1973 Evan Rood with a rotary engine in it. I don't know that much about a rotary. I, I bought it because I I was fascinated by the rotary engine, so I bought it. Uh, it's in really good shape. I've never done anything to it, just the way it is. It's original. And uh, it's made by OMG. Back in 1971, I bought a Skidoo Olympic, and I never really cared for it, and uh, I got rid of it and in 72. I bought a used 71 Chaparral, and then I bought a new 72 Chaparral, which they're home in my garage, and since then I restored this one, and I have a couple other ones I'm working on because I, they're just a nice riding machine. I, I just took a liking to Chaparral. So I'm kind of stuck with a few of them. <laughs> My son's uh, brother-in-law, he knew I liked chaparrales, and he stopped by one day, and he said, uh, he told me out on a corner in Saginaw there, there was a chaparral on a trailer. And I just rode out there, and I ended up buying the trailer and the chaparral for 100 bucks. And 
I told the lady, I said, if I ever get her restored, I'll bring it back, which I did. I, I took this sled back and showed her. She couldn't believe it because it was it was quite a rust bucket when I got it. Well, Chaparral, I never found out too much about them until uh, in 1970, I believe, Chaparral won the 500 in, at the Sioux, and that's when they started getting popular. Uh, I think they made machines in six in early 60s, but I'm not sure. But after they won the 500, Chaparral got pretty popular, and and they were also a really a good handling machine. They steer good and everything, and that's why I ended up with them. Well, today is our 19th annual show and ride, and um, of course the weather didn't help our our ride out. We still had 55 people leaving Auburn for our ride for the breakfast and uh, now we're out here having a little hot dog roast and the kids are playing with them and um, just talking sleds, having a good time. Telling lies, of course. What sled's better than the other? The kids are having a good time. That's what it's all about, the kids. day it's finally snowing it's great cooling down all this wet snow will freeze up look out that's enough <laughs> hi I have a story to tell my dad has an awful disease just follow me and I'll show you what his disease has grown into this is one of the early this is one of his early garages of course, I made the sign on the top when I was a kid and probably helped dig out most of all of this stuff out of somebody's back 40 field to get it into here <laughs> when I was a kid because my dad was lucky enough to have three girls and I, being the oldest, was the luckiest of all to be able to get to go dig all these babies out. And of course, back in the old days, they made the sleds very light. Then there's all of that stuff up there too. If you think this is bad, follow me. There's more. This is how my dad and I started, is I, we would go to people's houses and go through their stuff and dig it out and bring it here. So now it's all here. 
And that's probably why I have a little bit of a sore back today, still. <laughs> It's one of those things, uh, my dad was just, we always thought he was crazy, of course, we told him he was crazy a lot, and why do we have to go on another trip to go get a snowmobile? We couldn't do things that were really fun and cool as kids, we, the only place we got to go, and my mom, the only time she got a vacation, is when we went to go find a snowmobile. <laughs> And these are more of his actual prized possessions. Um, as a kid when I grew up, my grandfather sold Viking snowmobiles. So my dad has really gotten back into collecting the Vikings, because of course it brings back a lot of memories and when we were kids. Um, as I got older, um, my dad and my grandpa started selling scorpions. So um, when, when I was a teenager, a young teenager I guess I would say, um, my dad would take me, there's all kinds of smaller races that had, o small, all the small towns in the area had oval races. And when I was between, I don't know, the ages of 11 and 13, I used to take that 340 scorpion up there. And I used to have to race against all the boys who had four forks. So, but I did pretty good. <laughs> Having a sled smaller than everybody else, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and with all of this, we still have more. There's still another garage of which there is more snowmobiles and carts and those kinds of things in, but it's the heated garage. Okay, so this is the garage where they put the slides back together, take them apart, have to fix the clutches, um, all those kinds of things. There's also some more parts laying around and different things to make them all the finished product which end up at the museum or the shows, those kind of things. Um, my dad does have some rare snowmobiles. Um, his rare ones, a few of them are in the museum. And um, he's not the only person that has snowmobiles in the museum. There are several people that have um, donated their sleds to the museum. And we try to rotate them every six months so that it um, keeps it new and people can come back and enjoy something new. Very classic. <laughs> <laughs> All of this kind of probably stems to my love for snowmobiling also. And this weekend is actually a really big weekend for us. Um, this is my dad's dream is to have his own snowmobile museum. But him and his friends um, started a corporation and they started a snowmobile museum in Navinley, Michigan called the Top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum. This weekend is our show and ride weekend. So there are actually 28 snowmobiles missing out of this garage because they are over there at the show and we've been riding them today. And tomorrow, of course, we'll have our big show where all the sleds will be out there and many, many people bring their snowmobiles and it's just really a great time. And it's really awesome to see that everybody has um, just a love for this sport. And with the museum, it's everybody's museum.
just one day. One day. These guys are, are sick. <laughs>